So first we'll talk about why do we do perks. We do perks for big stones, big messes. We don't do it for little stones, unless certain specific circumstances, but in general, we do a PCNL for a stone that's bigger than 15 millimeters. Many of the mini PCNL studies have focused on stones that are smaller than 15 millimeters. So when you have a big mess, how many people have kids? Yeah, so everyone's got kids, we get big messes. Karen, I've seen some of the pictures when Steve watches Lily and Betty and you've got some messes to clean up at home. So would you rather use a little dust buster in your hand, get down on your knees and do this, or would you rather use a big hoover to sweep things up? Who'd like the, the dust buster? Okay. So the challenge here is we're, we're going to be comparing that vacuum effect. Yeah, we have a vacuum effect with the ultrasonic lithotriptor also. In fact, when you plan your access for PCNL, the main thing in your mind is how long can I use that standard nephroscope? Because that's my friend. That's how I get the ultrasonic probe in, the stone fragmented and aspirated. How do I get that big vacuum into the kidney, not the dust buster? It's important because time does matter. And the stage has been set already by the first talk in our session, death. Death from sepsis. Four out of a thousand people will die from PCNL. And yes, Karen showed some nice meta-analyses saying stone free rates are the same, OR times are shorter, transfusion rate is less, but there is nothing there about infection. There's nothing there about sepsis. And I'll show you a few things that raise some concern. Now you say, well, I can just give antibiotics and prevent that, but we know you can't. Treatment of a positive preoperative urine culture does not decrease the risk of sepsis and cannot be used as a reliable preventive measure. So we need to do everything we can to decrease the risk of sepsis and death. It's important. One out of three patients will have a systemic inflammatory response syndrome after PCNL, and these patients might die. And you could say, well, we know what the bacteria is going to be. It's a struvite stone, so it's a urease-producing organism. But the answer is no. What we were taught in purple, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Staph, Proteus, the urease-producing organisms are less common to find in a struvite stone. It's more common to find E. coli and enterococcus. Raising again the question, well, maybe we should be doing next-gen sequencing to, to identify all the organisms that are more likely to be in the stone than in the avoided urine. But more importantly, setting the stage that we need to do everything we can to decrease the risk of sepsis. Well, one of the things urologists do now is they just give more antibiotics. So Yes, we don't want to overuse antibiotics. Maybe that's the reason not to use next-gen sequencing. Or maybe this is the reason why we should be using next-gen sequencing so we aren't giving everyone three to seven days of antibiotics when the guidelines would say a single dose for PCNL and ureteroscopy. So that brings us to the topic of, well, you're talking a lot about bacteria and sepsis. What does that have to do with size? And you might say, oh, Manga, you're just getting old. You've got two young Doogie Housers here that you're debating. But we looked at this. We were the first group to actually look at this, along with Jackman at Hopkins. Kind of we're doing it simultaneously. He was using a, uh, a dilator set and a rigid, semi-rigid nephroscope, semi-rigid uteroscope, and then we were using flexible cystoscopes through a balloon-based model. Presented it at the UA, got a group together, all the big names, Lingaman, Perot, Preminger, and said, you know, let's do a randomized clinical trial. And, and that's about the same time where the, the study came out from Traxer that showed no difference. And you saw the slides that, that Karen shared with us. No difference in volume, no difference in, in parenchymal loss. So while we were thinking, well, maybe it would still cut down on blood loss, the sense of the gurus was that this wasn't a trial that needed to be done why would you do a mini perk when standard perk is doing better? Bringing us back to the question of infection, sepsis, intrarenal pressure, we do know that intrarenal pressures rise. 30 millimeters of mercury will cause a significant amount of backflow. We'll ask Dr. Stern whether she's looking at the lithoview elite. Does she feel that this new scope that will allow us to measure the pressures has value or not? And if she says yes, then that means she thinks this is an important issue. Well, if pressures are important, what happens with a mini perk? And you see that at all steps of the procedure, the pressures are higher with a mini or micro perk compared to this conventional perk. 
it correlates with the size. So the smaller you get, the higher the pressures. And the more time you spend above that threshold of 30 millimeters of mercury. So here are 14 French. 316 minutes above the threshold where bacteria are getting seeded into the bloodstream, the liver, and the spleen. And yes, Karen can say, well, you haven't studied that in humans, but I'm waiting for her study where she biopsies livers and spleens after a perk to see if there's bacteria in there. So you're right. We can't necessarily say that that porcine model correlates with humans, but it's the best we got. We also have evidence that the intrarenal pressures does correlate with the risk of, of postoperative fever. The higher the pressures, the higher the likelihood that the patient will have a high fever. And then this was the study she alluded to but didn't emphasize down here. Positive cultures from the spleen, the liver, and the blood more likely to happen if you use a mini perk because the pressures are higher and the time above 30 millimeters of mercury is higher. She did a, a very good job of summarizing the meta-analyses, which says uh, that really there's no difference in, in terms of um, outcomes with the exception of OR time and bleeding. And yes, I think our 4% blood transfusion rate in the literature, or perhaps our current 1% blood transfusion rate is very similar. There are many variables that go into transfusion rates. How The most important thing is how accurate the puncture is, as opposed to how big the hole is you make after the puncture. So the variables that need to be looked at are ultrasound versus uh, endoscopic guided, fluoroscopic guided, in terms of the accuracy of your puncture. And that's going to make it less likely that when you compare a mini perk to standard perk, you'll see a difference in the transfusion rates. And the length of stays are comparable, as Dr. Stern alluded to, both herself and Dr. Beaches have been pioneers at sending patients home the same day, irrespective of whether it's a 30 French or a, or a mini perk. So we'll end here. We're doing a PCNL together. Dr. Stern's on this side thinking, thank God that's a 30 French sheath, and we're not going to be here for three or four hours. Thank you.